Good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dean Carroll. I'm the publisher at Mumbrella Asia. Um, if you have been at the conference over the past two days, welcome back. If today is your first day, uh, a fresh welcome to you. Um, it was quite, a, quite an event yesterday. Um, who could forget the lie detector session um, and the inspirational keynote from Christian Kurz of Viacom? or indeed the insights from Tom Doctoroff on China, um, just to name but three of the myriad excellent sessions yesterday. It was quite a night too, let me tell you, at the Mumbrella Asia Awards and the 360 Gala Dinner. Um, congratulations to the winners. Um, I suspect there are a few of you in the audience and indeed a few hangovers after last night. Um, but never fear though, um, we have plenty of treats in store today to blow away the cobwebs including, uh, next up, the, the marketing story behind Grab's startling rise from startup to billion-dollar unicorn company in the space of just four years, quite something. Um, so that will be first on stage here this morning. Um, and just to say, please do get involved in the audience Q&As at the end of most sessions. Um, 360 is really about community, so that will help to drive, drive the community along. So that would be great if you could do that. Um, so enough of, from me for now, other than to say thank you again for the to the sponsors, um, the curators, uh, and you, the delegates, and our speakers, for your support. It really is appreciated. And now let's get straight into it. Please do welcome back to the stage our MC, the Thomson Reuters journalist, Melanie Ralph. Thank you, and enjoy the conference. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Umbrella 360 Asia Conference here in Singapore. I'm Melanie Ralph with Thomson Reuters, and it's my pleasure to be hosting the event and helping you navigate today's events, and what a packed event we have today. For those of you who attended yesterday, welcome back, and for those of you who are joining just for today, a warm welcome to you as well. Yesterday, we um, had the chance to discuss some of the current trends and key issues in the media and marketing industry um, that hopefully will help you move your business forward. Today, we expect to continue that journey, hopefully leaving you inspired and informed to do your job better. But before we move on to the key event of Grab's marketing um, uh, conference in a minute, we do have a few housekeeping bits to go through. Um, phones, if you can keep those to silent, um, but do continue to tweet and Instagram. Join in the conversation, hashtag M360Asia. Wi-Fi spots, there are Wi-Fi spots uh, all around, but we do have a sponsored free will uh, network. You can find the credentials to get into that on your name badges. The agenda, we do, as I say, have a very packed and exciting agenda today. Um, to help you figure out where you want to go, because the ses sessions are going on concurrently, so you need to have a little bit of a plan in place uh, for the day. We do have the Mumbrella 360 Asia app that you can download from the App Store or from Google Play, and you can build your program. Um, so going back to uh, the layout, there are toilets um, nearly everywhere, actually. If you go out of these doors left or right, you'll find the toilets on the main uh, corridors. So no problems there. That's well catered for. Um, and do explore um, the area in your free time and break. We do have the expo area just opposite us in the Roselle Ballroom, um, which also has the master classes that's sponsored by Reprise, just uh, as I say, opposite. And you'll never be bored because we filled every single gap of the day. We also have lunchtime debates. Don't worry, you can take your food and drink along with you. Um, we do have gourmet coffee sponsored by the South China Morning Post that you can pick up and take along to a lunchtime debate. Today's debate is um, bridging the gap between marketing and sales. Lessons from Huawei, IBM, and Accenture. Just to give you a little uh, note about the stages as well, this room will actually split into two, um, into the innovation and the population stage. The content stage and the people stages will be found the other side of the exhibition hall. If you get lost, please do feel free to ask a member of staff, we're here to help, uh, or there are several signs actually up around the place to help you get to where you need to get to. 
There are sessions alerts to let you know when the next session will start. You'll hear a little bell that uh, goes off. Um, if you can make your way promptly to those sessions, um, that will help proceedings a lot. Don't worry if you are late, because if we see that the, you know, people are taking time to get there, we will delay session starts, so we do try and accommodate that. But do take your belongings with you, because we will be turning around the rooms uh, often to um, do those new sessions. So why don't we get straight into it today and to the first keynote speaker of the day, which is Cheryl Goh. She's the Vice President of Marketing at Grab. In her role, she shapes the strategy behind the company's astonishing user growth, uh, country expansion, and service diversification. She also oversees Grab's marketing efforts across the region. In her own words, Cheryl left a cushy corporate job uh, to join the company back when nobody had heard of it four years ago. And she actually spent a decade in leadership roles in the digital space, mostly in uh, technology companies such as MOL Global and Friendster. She also headed up the New Straits Times press group's digital arm and served as a group digital general manager at Nissan Malaysia. Cheryl holds a Bachelor of uh, Commerce in e Economics and Marketing from Curtin University. She's an avid underwater photographer, ladies and gentlemen, and considers herself a true Gen Y. And she's here today to discuss Grab's journey from a startup to a billion dollar unicorn company in, this, in the space of just four years. An amazing story. So please, would you join me in welcoming Cheryl Go? Good morning. I'm a little nervous. So, you know, please forgive me if I, like, um, you know, sound really nervous. So anyway, um, you know, four years ago, if someone told me, Cheryl, you'll be speaking about marketing at a Mumbrella event in Singapore, I would think that they were out of their mind. And the reason is because prior to joining Grab, my career had very little marketing experience. I built my career mainly in sales and business development, and then I went on to do general management. And that was a very big part of where I wanted to take my career. And so, until I met Anthony Tan, who is the founder and CEO of Grab, I never really even considered it as a career path. But as fate would have it, I met him, and uh, he, he convinced me on their mission. He, he, you know, and I became really interested about the organization. And you know, as somehow, miraculously, we both decided that I would head up marketing, even though I had very, very little first-hand experience. So when I made this decision, um, my parents were very, very unhappy with me. I honestly come from a pretty average background. I didn't do that well in school. I played a lot of Counter-Strike. And um, so, you know, didn't go to Ivy League, didn't, go, didn't, didn't get much of a, you know, like great, uh, I, I guess I wouldn't say great profile. And from there, I had to climb really hard to get myself in the position that I was at that point of time. So when I thought about joining Grab, I was a general manager in a media company. It was a really nice, cushy sort of job, nice big room. When I joined, based on my level, they knocked down the wall because they said, you need another one feet more based on your title. Um, and so I, I joined a company and my parents were very proud. They were like, yes, my daughter, not too bad, managed to get here. Um, and, but somehow I decided, you know, one day I went back to them and said, you know, mom and dad, I'm going to join this startup. Um, their office is in the storeroom right now. It's okay. That would change. That was the early days. And uh, they, they really just couldn't understand it, right? Because when I joined, Grab wasn't even called Grab. We were called My Taxi. We were operating out of a storeroom. And all we had was vision and dreams. This was even before Series A. So we were at seed stage. Um, and so, you know, for, for, I really had a lot of discussions with them and they were super not pleased with this decision, right? But I guess there is this quote that I really, really like, and it says, tell me what it is that you plan to do with your, wild, your one wild and precious life. And you only have one to live, right? So for me, 
If you know me personally, you will know one thing. I really hate driving. And I'm also really bad at it. Um, the first time I ever met Anthony, he asked me to drop him off because he, the, where we met and where his house was was really close and I got into a minor accident. So it would be good for all of humankind if I also didn't drive, right? So, you know, I, and so because I hated driving, it meant that I spent 20 years as a really frustrated public transportation user. And if you're from Malaysia, you'll understand what that means. In the past, you know, you, you can't get, you don't know what's the fare because they never use the meter. They will negotiate, they will tell you where they want to go. You say, I, I want to go somewhere. They say, no, too far. You know, so um, I spent 20 years being super frustrated about that and this opportunity came up. And I thought, you know what? Why don't I jump on it? Because I can change something I so passionately hate. Um, and so I took the leap. Four years on, this uh, startup today is Southeast Asia's um, number one ride-hailing company. We are in 142 cities in seven countries. Two million drivers depend on them, depend on us for employment opportunities. We are in 65 million mobile devices. And despite not having much marketing experience, we've done really well. We've won quite a few awards for the work that we do. So these days, you know, obviously, we, you know, Grab's in the news quite a lot, right? And so my parents think that it's a, it wasn't that bad of a decision. And so I always get to remind them that this is why I never listen to them. So, and, and beyond just, you know, like a, sort of like our scale, we also do work to solve real problems. We started out with taxis, we then realized people also like cars, and then in some countries like Indonesia, where the traffic is terrible, there was a need for bikes. And then we also then realized that there were different levels of affordability for people, and because of that, we launched things like carpooling and grab hitch, shuttle and buses, all of that makes um, transportation more affordable, and we also have food and deliveries. So besides just moving you from point A to point B, we've become a company that really can shape transportation in Southeast Asia. We solve for unemployment, we solve for congestion, and we also solve for efficiency and taking you closer to the things that matters to you. And um, really proud, 26th of October, at, um, which is just a couple of weeks ago, or just the last two weeks, at 7.34 p.m., we, in one second, 66 rides happen across seven countries to take us to our one billionth ride. And um, and, and I'm really proud, you know, I'm very, really proud of the company that we are, the values that we still hold, and the change that we want to continue to, the make, to, the wo to make to the world. Um, and I'm also really proud of how marketing at Grab has contributed to this growth, because we are a cornerstone for what makes this organization work. So today, when I was putting uh, together this presentation, I guess, I think the big question that we have to keep, and, and I, I, I constantly have to um, ask this, or, or make sure that we are in this position, how do we set up marketing to own growth goals in the organization? How, as a marketing team, do you continue to contribute to something that is meaningful so that you are not path, so that you're not toothless, you know? And I think that's where, what I kind of wanted to share my experience um, at Grab. So, five things, I put together five things um, that I think we, we've done to stay very aligned with the growth goals. And the first um, key thing for us was um, this concept of one metrics that matters, right? So when, when I joined Grab, there were a lot of things that needed to be done. You know, we needed to drive downloads because that's what you need before you can use the app. We needed to drive for awareness. We could have, you know, run events to help recruit drivers. There were a lot of things that we could do, but we had not much money. So I think I started out by asking the founder uh, Anthony, like, what, 
is it that really matters to the organization? What is that needle-moving thing that as an organization we must all care about? And for us in the early days, that one metric that matters is, is rights. And the reason why that was so is because it, it means that there's enough passengers booking a ride and enough drivers picking them up, and that completes one ride. So we decided that this is the one thing that matters for us at Grab. Um, and then we, we divide and conquer. So marketing, we are the sole cust custodian of driving consumer growth. There is no one else in the organization that does this. And operations, they drive driver growth. So I do passenger, they do driver. And, and I think um, it was very clear and very straightforward how we would move forward, right? So very bluntly, my job was to just get more butts in cars and bikes. Very, very straightforward. That is my only goal. And because it was very, very clear what I needed to do, what was my metric for success, that clarity really helps us as a marketing team to focus less on metrics which are perceptual. So things like followers, impressions, brand, clicks are just perceptual. Instead, we focus very much on things that were behavioral. We needed to get people to download, to write, you know, to refer. And so that single clarity of knowing what method to the organization helped us in making sure that whatever we do, we feed to that goal. Um, so, and, and also the other thing that was very key is that I knew that, you know, Grab is a dual-sided platform. So I knew that if I didn't uh, do my job, we would fail because there was no one else looking at this part of the business. So this was actually the first campaign in Grab that I've ever done. We were still called my taxi then, and I was trying to get people to, I was obviously trying to get more rights, right? So the campaign that I came up with uh, was called 990 to the airport. If you've ever been, and remember this is the time that we had no money, we needed something that can go viral. So if you've ever uh, been in Malaysia, you'll know that airport rides are about 70 ringgit. So this was a super good deal, and so it got a lot of people talking. But because we didn't have budget, that much budget, this deal only applied on Wednesdays, the day that nobody travels. <laughs> but uh, it was really good because you know, a lot of people talked about it, and, and, and what we saw was that, sure, on Wednesdays, our rides were about 50% higher than normal for airport rides, but throughout the week, we also saw average increase of 20 to 30%. So I think, you know, we went down that path of understanding what it is that we're optimizing for, and we created a campaign for it. It would have been a lot easier to do a, a download campaign or an awareness campaign. But the first campaign that we ever did was one that really moved the needle. And we continue to be very focused in doing that at Grab. So why is it important to actually um, you know, like really focus on why is it really important to, to know what metric you're con converting for? The reason is because it's very easy, especially for marketers or, or actually any part of the business, to convert for the wrong reason. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the gaming industry, but if you play games, you know that for companies, they optimize for something called ARPU, average revenue per user. And if they are ads driven, then they, they optimize for active users, right? This is their key metric. So this is just an example, this game. Uh, someone probably didn't brief the, the marketing team well. They probably briefed them, get us downloads, instead of what, is re what really matters, which is get us active users. And so the designer came up with this design and said, okay, it's a medieval game, uh, free forever, very good call to action, and you know, it performed whatever. And so the next campaign, he says, let me try an experiment and make this better by putting a girl and say, free forever, help save the queen. And of course, you know, results were okay. And then he went on to put two girls, because that's what always works, right? Save your lover, play now, my lord. And after that, you know, you can experiment with more cleavage, and then eventually you can end up with this. So obviously the final version of this um, would drive a lot of downloads, but if the person ever gets to the game, they will never play it. And I think that's the importance of understanding what are you converting for, because are you converting for downloads or are you converting for real users? So 
first one, which was a bit long, um, I think you have to identify and measure that one metric that matters, and then you need to convert to achieve that. Okay, so the second thing that every great marketing sh team should also do to be a key cornerstone for growth is to really understand and use data. So um, if for some of you may know that Grab's next play is, is actually in payments. And so we see ourselves as becoming more and more of a payments company in the next couple of years. And the first thing that, uh, big thing that we launched two weeks ago is offline acceptance, which means that with your same Grab app, you can now pay for food and services. Um, and we, marketing was a very key part of driving the entire go-to-market strategy. So the first thing we did was we decided like, which, what kind of merchants do we go after? And we used focus groups to understand the opportunity. And for us, we decided to go with small um, hawker centers and independent merchants and uh, entrepreneurs because they, they are often the people that are ignored by larger financial institutions and there was an opportunity there. So we use focus groups to kind of help us drive that strategy. And then the next thing is like, you know, Grab is in, if you believe Facebook and Google data, we are in 100% of mobile devices in Singapore. We have 100% penetration. Um, so, you know, if you have 100% penetration, the next step is really you should, take, you, you should make use of your existing audience. So for us, uh, we looked at our sort of like right density. We figured out which areas were there a lot of our users who were already using our payment services. And we wanted to start with those areas because it's an easy way to kind of like move into the market. By the way, all this data is, is fake, so don't, don't use it, but just the methodology, okay? Um, so, you know, if you look at the data, it's like, this doesn't make sense, the outcome, yes, that's why. So, uh, the next thing we do, um, we did, besides uh, identifying right density areas, we looked at, um, we, we got temps to actually comb targeted areas to count for us how big was that, that market how many shops fell into that category of hawker and independent uh, merchants? And then based on that, we kind of overlaid data, uh, and it told us where should we start and where we shouldn't go. So I think my point about all of this is, and this is just one very easy to understand example of what we use data for and how it drives the decision that we make. And my point here is if you understand how to use data really well as a marketing team, you are a very crucial part of driving business strategy. Okay. Um, so the third thing is this. I think as marketeers, besides understanding data and, and using it to drive strategy, we also need to remember that we are the voice of the consumer. And, and um, what's really important is to, to realize that there's a lot of information. All this information is super valuable to the entire organization. And we shouldn't just, as marketers, be using that information to run great marketing campaigns. I mean, that's one of them for sure. But beyond that, how do you productize that insight? And um, this is a, one thing that I'm super proud of. The marketing team led this and still continues to, to sort of like champion this. We launched Grab Rewards. And this was a fully-led marketing initiative. We came out with the initial study and concept of how to do it. And I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but basically for every ride that you make at Grab, you earn points. That points allows you to do all kinds of things like redeem a green crisp flyer. You can redeem ice cream at McDonald's, whatever it might be, right? And um, one really interesting insight about, us, about this was that um, a lot of people actually can claim rides, like taxi, car, the company pays for them. So even if you give them a promo, they're like, ah, doesn't matter because my company's gonna pay for it. Uh, but for loyalty points, they get to keep it and they get to use it. So it's a very powerful retention tool. And uh, beyond just driving retention, it's a great tool for partnerships and there are a lot of other opportunities such as advertising. So this is just uh, one example of how marketing can drive not just strategy and campaigns, but as well as products. Uh, another example is Grab Family. So in Singapore, a lot of people don't drive, and um, you have young kids, but there's no car seat in the car. So we launched Grab Family because of that need. Uh, we launched it in Singapore, and uh, we sort of like started the idea, and uh, operations then took over and made this like really successful and scale it out. Um, 
So today, marketing is um, really large. 300 people, a couple of them here, not enough work. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we are about 3,000 employees today, right? And um, what really continues to set us apart is the people that we hire. And one of the things that we, we did right was we really hired people that had a lot of passion, especially in the early days. This super matters that you hire people who are truly passionate about your goals. And um, this wasn't a brilliant strategy by Grab in the early days. We just had no money. So anybody that wanted to join us pretty much took a pay cut. So they must have been super passionate and like super crazy about it. And so we, was, we were that lucky because a lot of the early guys that joined us, they were willing to sacrifice like pretty big positions to be with us because they believe in that mission. And until today, we still hire for that. We still try and, I mean, it's a very large workforce, but I think what sets us apart is our people are truly passionate and go above and beyond that call. Um, so maybe just an example that I really like. This is actually Brian. This is very recent. Um, so Brian's our country head for Philippines. So he's the most senior person in the Philippines. And he realized that, you know, this happened, he realized about eight months ago that there was a lot of driver unhappiness and so what he did was he used his same Facebook account, the one that he used with his family, his kids, to address driver's concern. Because he believes that as the most senior person in Grab, if, if Grab Philippines, I put my face out there, it gives a lot of assurance to the drivers that I am committed to solve their problems. And this can only happen if you hire people who are truly, truly passionate about what, you know, what we do. Um, the second example, which is a video I'm going to play, um, it's, um, it came from the intention of we want to do something good and something nice for our drivers. We then recorded it, it then became a, a great video, so maybe you can watch. Terima kasih kerana datang hadirkan diri untuk bersama-sama saya walaupun hanya untuk beberapa jam. Saya semua Satu dari jauh pun terkejut.
So um, something that we didn't quite stage, I think all the emotions, as you can see, is very raw, no actors involved. And it's really started with just how do we reward our top drivers by giving them time with their family because they spend so much time on the road. Um, we also really invest in a lot of programs for our drivers. We, you know, we believe that we are not just li their livelihoods, we also can help their lives. Um, and we make a lot of business decisions based on the values that we have. So we, we believe very greatly in safety, and so if you take a bike, on grab bike, do know that we put every single driver on the platform through a safety driving test. That easily extends the sign-up process by three days, and nobody in the right hailing space bothers to do that because it slows you down, and it really does, and it costs you money. But we believe in the values that of why we joined and why we started this company. And so that's why, you know, I think we continue to do that. And we also use our network to do, um, you know, like this is a big campaign. I, I, I'm not going to show the video because I think I'm running out of time. But um, this is a campaign where we use, we, it came from the insight that people would do, want to do good things, but you just have to make it kind of convenient. And so we asked people in our entire base donate books and toys to children, and then you just press a button, we'll come and collect it. And we had enough books and toys to fund, we had 8,000 books and toys. I think we ended up building 12 libraries or something like that. It was very, very uh, amazing. So I'm just gonna skip through this. So the last factor that um, I wanna talk about is you, you need to take risks. And, and the thing about risk is that it's not about being negligent, right? You put every single, you know, a lot of rigor into making sure that you've thought through this and you do your best. But if you are doing maybe different work, interesting work, work that is out there, um, you know, I think there, there, there is risk involved, right? And, and I think I've never made as many mistakes as when I've worked in Grab, you know, I've made so many mistakes from things like setting up promos, you know, deciding on what media to buy. But I think that's, that's just what happens, right? And there's this saying that I really like, you know, you take risks because, you know, if you win, you'll be happy, and if you lose, you'll be wise, right? So here are some campaigns that we, we were a bit risky in. Um, so Pokemon Go, big phenomenon, you know, it, it was, um, you know, it was a big, massive wave, and we were really keen to ride on it, and so we did, right? We had a Pokemobile where you can, you know, hunt your Pokemon Go's in the car. We did this together with Maxis. Uh, we did all kinds of campaigns, and because we were one of the first, I would say we were the first brand in Southeast Asia to latch on it, we got a lot of coverage. People like Mashable and Yahoo, all the local news channels were, you know, like, um, were writing about this collaboration. And, and, and I think for a lot of brands, they would have been very afraid to do this because the tie-up would have been very long. So I think we ride on that wave and we really took advantage of it. Um, the second thing uh, that a lot of people say is that billboards can only be used for you know, awareness and what, uh, but I think for us in Indonesia, we use it for direct response. So when we're rolling out a campaign, we actually bought a lot of billboards. A lot of people said this is not the way to use it, but we did it anyway. Uh, we, we did a promotion, we drive new users, it was for a short period. Everything that people say you shouldn't do with billboards, we did it, right? And this campaign actually was so successful in terms of channel selection that we've run it three times in one year. It's something that drives a lot of scale and a lot of impact, and, you know, it, it's a bit different. Um, the next one when it comes to risk is sometimes you just have to trust people and this is a video that an agency, we don't really use agencies that much, but this was a video that an agency really wanted to do for us. And, and it, was based, it was done in Thailand, and the insight was um, people were not using Grab because by the th Thailand has a lot of taxis. So by the time you get at the side of the road and try booking a Grab, it's much faster to just flag. And so what we were trying to get people to do is book in the office, book in your house, and then wait for it to arrive, and then you walk out instead of, because the habit before that was they walked out, 
to the, to the curbside, and then they start booking. So we were trying to educate people not to do that. And um, a Thai agency came up with this ad, and they were very confident that it would work, and I was very, very unconvinced. Um, and so I said, okay, how convinced are you? And he says, my reputation is at stake. I said, like, that's rubbish. How about some money? So um, we cut there. I told them we, so we had a hard target of how many rides I want to achieve with the campaign. I mean, it wasn't just video. They were also out of home and all of that to drive this message. And I said that if we don't hit X amount of rides, I'm cutting 15%, and they agreed. And they also negotiated for a premium, right, which we also agreed. So this is the video that they did. It was a bit of a bet, but I really liked the fact that they were that passionate. And it was already, we also are quite hard negotiators. So in the first place, the price was already kind of low for the work. So it wasn't something that I believe there was actually buffer in for them to you know, offer that 15% suddenly. Uh, mm, sorry, can you guys play? Uh, hit the play button. Okay. So the payoff actually is that um, smart people are lazy and smart people book grab in the comforts of their home. That was basically the message in the video that we ran across a lot of channels like Billboard. We did mainly this video uh, that was online and we did some outdoor, so um, like some targeted spots. And this campaign is probably one of the most successful uh, campaign that ever worked for us. So I think when it comes to taking risks, you also sometimes have to trust and work really well with the agencies that, that you have, right? So I think it's hard to talk about risks uh, and then assume that it's riskless, right? You take risks, you're going to make some mistakes. And I think in my career, this is probably the most dramatic. I don't know how many of you have, know about this campaign, but if you, it was a, a campaign that we did in conjunction with uh, Breast Cancer Month, and it blew up like, like none other. If you ever Google um, Grab Taxi Love Boobs campaign, you can see that the reaction, I'm not going to explain what the campaign is about, but the, the reaction for this campaign was so negative, it was unbelievable. I've been on BBC twice in my life. One is for this, and one more when there was riots in Indonesia. I appeared on TV next to people tearing down my billboards. So that's my career highlights, but um, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and I remember when this happened, it was really 
terrible because it was exploding up on all these news channels. People that don't, like BBC, who never writes about my campaign, suddenly decided, yes, I shall write about this wonderful campaign that Grab did. And I remember the worst part of it all is that this happened right when I was in a management retreat with all my peers in Bali. And I felt, oh my god. It was a horrible feeling because you are in front of all the people that you are accountable for, and they're all with you in the same room, so you can't really like dig a hole and die. And I, I do remember, uh, I told my boss, I told Anthony, I was like, oh my God, this thing has happened. I'm going to do like uh, some recovery. And I explained to him what was the thought process and how we ended up in the place that we were. And he didn't say much, he said, oh, it's okay. So anyway, that was the day before. And then the next day, I, I, that night I couldn't sleep. And then the next day we started day two of management retreat. And um, I remember walking into the hall, my CEO was on stage, he was wearing this t-shirt. And he said, I want to remind you that when you do this kind of work, there is that possibility that things don't go your way. It doesn't mean that you stop doing that kind of work. And I wear this in support of that. So, what can I say? <laughs> so anyway, I think um, I've, you know, I, I think we, we, are, we try very hard to be careful, but we will never always be right. I think this is the reality that I remind myself when my team also does work for us. I think negligent work is bad work, but if you try your best and you still make wrong decisions because you were being risky in the first place, that's life, man. So the last picture actually, you know, from this and, and also actually many other bad things, I mean, not great things that Grab has done, mistakes that we've done, I actually organized a session a couple of, maybe, a couple of months ago, it's called uh, The Greatest Fuck-Ups of 2016, and it was great. So it was audience participation, and people shared, and there were people from Twitter who shared like how they fuck up this presidential campaign, this other person from Nikon who had that, you know, I don't know whether how many of you remember, there was this picture fiasco where there was a photo, it was a, the picture that won for a Nikon photo competition was photoshopped. So, you know, everybody shared, and it was just, and I think, you know, it's good to remember that you can learn from your success as much as you can learn from your mistakes, and sometimes even more. So I wanted to end on that note, um, and say to all of you, you know, I wanted to end with that campaign, to just highlight that it's okay to make mistakes, and I think if you are really trying to do something meaningful for the organization, it's, it's bound to happen. But I think what we need to remember is, how do we make sure that we are part of the business discussion? How do we own a seat at that table? And for us, it was five things. Um, find that business metric that really matters to you. You need to really know your data and use it in the most strategic way possible. Do not believe that marketing cannot influence product. You very well can. You can very well drive strategy. You need to really hire people that are passionate. Um, and last but not least, to create a safe environment for risk. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Cheryl. That was a fantastic and insightful presentation. We do actually have some time for some questions and answers, okay. so if you'd like to come and join me sitting on these seats, we can get some questions from the audience, maybe. So first off, uh, anyone, any questions? Right, we have someone at the back there. If we just, if you wait a minute, you get the mic, and if you can introduce yourself and ask your question. Sure, thank you. Good morning. I'm Glenn from Van Media Group. Uh, great presentation. I use Grab all the time, so I'm a fan, and I collect my points and I use them. Uh, thank you. But the point is not to ask you about that. The point is, uh, how do you look at competitors in other markets? For example, like Gojek in Indonesia, which is not just doing rides, but doing deliveries and all, all those sorts of things. From a marketing challenge, marketing perspective. Uh, there are a lot of com competitors out uh, in your markets. How are you facing them and how are you competing against them? So there's, there's two parts to this, right? I think number one is, um, okay, I'll give you the non-PC answer, which is Grab is super competitive. We really believe in pushing the boundaries and really outserving our customers. And what that means is that we need to spend a lot of time understanding them and also understanding what the competition is doing. Find our opportunities and kind of tackle that. And, and we will never always be in the best position, right? We, when we started, we, 
we didn't have the most money. Because we're in Southeast Asia, when you compare against like US giants, we won't have the best tech. It doesn't mean that because of that, you can't compete. Like a lot of people tell me, hey, um, Uber has a better driver app. And I'm saying, okay, but we'll treat our drivers better. So I think competition is very normal. It's part of business. And I think there's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, I think you just need to identify what makes you different, what is your opportunity, and really work on that. So what, what is the key to customer retention, though? So you, you get the clients in, and you get the drivers and everything, but what's the key to keeping that momentum going? Right. I think it really is about customer experience. When we started, I mentioned that, that one metric that mattered for Grab was rights. Over time, of course, as we mature as an organization, there are other things that we care about. And so for us, we really optimize for alloc allocation, which is basically matching you with a driver. And I think at the end of the day, people want to get from point A to point B safe, hassle-free, um, seamless. And I think as long as we continue doing that, you've met like the basic requirement. And then the next step is what can you layer on to keep customers more sticky, which is why we have things like Grab Rewards. So I think it's a combination of number one, really meeting your customers' expectation, and then layering on things that delight them and, and keep them coming back. Any other questions from the floor? Got someone down here or over there? Over there first, I think, and then we'll come to you in a minute. Hello, good morning. Mark Lowney, Hongbao Media. At what point in, in that breast cancer campaign that you ended up backtracking on, did you decide instead of we want to push on, we want to stand by the courage of our convictions, and no tipping point reached, we have to backtrack? Yep. So we didn't fully retract the campaign. There was actually a particular video as part of that campaign that we use influencer, an influencer, YouTuber for, that a lot of people found very offensive. Um, and so we removed that video. We then apologized that we, and there were other parts of it, the delivery of it, because it came in as an SMS. And so the way, the phrasing of that wasn't something that people liked, and, and I actually think that that was uh, our fault. We didn't really execute that well. So I think I, I apologize, so I, we removed the video. I apologize for the oversight, but I believe, but we still went ahead, and we told people that, we're, you know, this is where we, we did a really bad job, but this is our intent. And our intent was actually to drive awareness and to collect money from selling certain things, from giving people a cut of our rights. And we still went ahead with that. So I think we, we definitely apologize for you know, what I would consider um, the decisions that weren't great. But we still went ahead because I think the intent is pure and comes from that place. Um, we had a question just down here at the front, if we can get the mic just down here. Thank you. Hi there. Um, you, you met you mentioned that you don't often use agencies. I just wondered why that um, would be the case, and, and when do you feel the need to use agencies, if that makes sense? Um, so the, the first reason was because of costs. When we started, we didn't have enough margin money, and we couldn't afford an agency. As we got bigger, it was speed. So we do things really quick. We can turn around campaigns within 24 hours, depending on, like, say there's a flood in Penang. In a, in a certain market. We can turn around creative work for that really quick. Um, and even for bigger campaigns, we, we are a company that believes in a 12-week cycle. We do quarterly planning. So a lot changes in a very short amount of time, just like the landscape itself. So I think that's why we have struggled to use agencies. It's not that we don't use any at all. I think when it comes to certain maybe brand work or maybe when it comes to campaigns that or product launches, which are long, long lead time, we might. But um, it's mainly those two reasons. We, it's hard for us to find an agency that can respond to us in a quick in turnaround time and still charge us a rate that we can, we can stomach. And we have a very large creative team. I think we have 50, 60 people in the organization today. Um, I was just going to ask you about your expansion in Southeast Asia because that's been very successful indeed. What part of the marketing has made that 
possible? So um, I think part of it is because so marketing is, there's a lot of functions at Grab today. We have product marketing, product, I think marketing is one of the oldest functions, and because of that, there is a lot of experience when it comes to launching markets. So I think generally, we always go in thinking about what is the opportunity in this market. So for example, when we launched, uh, when we were evaluating Myanmar, which is our latest market, uh, latest country, we understood that um, generally there is no meter in the taxi, they don't turn on the air conditioning. People hate that. So, you know, one, you know, so at least as part of our education, we, we educate that you need to give this kind of service, turn on the air conditioning, use the meter, and, and I think there are other nuances that we, we bring to the table to make sure that the business works. So I think what really matters is understanding what is the local problem and then customizing a solution that really fits. And I think for every market, that's slightly different. It's, it's why we launch bikes, because we realize that in some markets, cars just take a lot long, longer and people want extra time. It's why we have carpooling. It's why we have shuttle, because you know, some people can't afford to do door-to-door, end-to-end -door, um, -end sort of transport, because it's out of their income uh, bracket. So I think just understanding that and then working to resolve that um, by building products, running campaigns, uh, I guess is what we do to make sure that we are uh, very relevant. I know that's not a very marketing answer, but like I said, I think the thing about Grab and marketing at Grab is that you, you do do more than just advertising. But is there a certain element? Uh, does online have more impact than, uh -huh. I, I know you mentioned the billboards, yep. but is, do you find one method right. more effective okay. than the other? So we, we always start with PR uh, because, you know, I think, it's always, usually when we're going into a market, there is really a problem to be solved. And also, especially Grab at this size today, we do get quite a lot of media attention if we do anything. Um, so we always start with PR. PR is always the big push. Uh, we then try to use digital as much as possible. In some markets, that's a bit harder than others, but digital is a very next uh, obvious thing. And then we use billboards. Generally for launch, that's kind of what we do. It's a combination of billboards, it's a lot of PR, um, a lot of online, and then out of home. These are the three things that we generally do for uh, market launches. Any other questions? Oh yes, up back there. Hi again, Dean Carroll from Umbrella Asia. Um, uh, just a question around drivers. Obviously, it's part of the company's DNA that you have this real focus on drivers and treating them well, and indeed, that's part of your marketing strategy now and perhaps differentiates you from companies who shall remain unnamed but are rivals. Um, where do you see the future? So once we move to self-driving cars, a post-human future for Grab, how will the company change and how will your marketing change once we get to that point? Yep. So I think we are more likely to first arrive in a world where people don't have we're more likely to arrive into a world where people don't have private cars than self-driving cars. I think more people will actually give up owning a car than you know, the day that we get to where everybody owns a self-driving vehicle. I think we are seeing that in, in a lot of markets. And when the day comes, which it will come, that self-driving vehicles become prevalent, we see our drivers doing higher, higher order things. So for example, helping you open the door, helping you do delivery, helping you do concierge services. We do not see it as a complete replacement, just them contributing at a higher level towards providing a better customer experience. That, that's how we see it. There's lots of questions out there, so I'm going to go out to the floor again. Any more questions? Yeah. Let's get the mic just okay, in a little bit here. Hi. I'm Riddhi from OMD. So Grab has been a big brand. Everyone knows the verb as a brand now. Uh, but I know earlier it was referred to as My Taxi. So what led to the decision to change it from My Taxi to Grab and how was the transition? Okay, so we started in Malaysia and so the, we were called My Taxi and the taxi was actually Malay spelling. And so when we started expanding into Philippines, we called it My Taxi, like English spelling, and then we got a cease and desist letter because there is other company in Europe that's using that name. 
So we, we couldn't use uh, my taxi English spelling outside. We couldn't use it at all, basically. And so we renamed at that point of time outside of Malaysia. So we, we, we maintain my taxi for the longest of times. And then for all other markets, we call ourselves Grab Taxi. And we then decided to drop the word taxi from our name because we became much more than that. And it really became a problem because a lot of users, especially in Indonesia, the first time they were exposed to us is because they used the bike service. And so for them, it doesn't register searching for the word Grab Taxi to get our app. It's like, why am I searching for a taxi app? I, I want a bike app. So I think Grab is a better representation of what the company that we are today, the company that we want to be. And so I think it was a business decision more than a brand decision. I think we, we outgrew the, the name. More questions from the floor. I know a lot of you are wanting to ask questions. Yeah, just in the middle here. Hi, um, Cheryl. Thanks for the presentation. It was great insights into how you guys have grown so rapidly um, in Southeast Asia. <coughs> uh, Bianca from ISG. So my question is around loyalty and, and the role of brand. I think car share is a very price sensitive market and I'm sure a lot of us often are toggling between a couple of apps to figure out what the cheapest way is to get from A to B. Um, you've employed loyalty strategies to differentiate yourself in this space and drive retention. What else is Grab doing to drive brand preference and, and loyalty with its customers? So I think like what you correctly mentioned, I think rewards is a very big part of that strategy. But I, I also do believe in brand. It's just something that we, we haven't really, um, we're a young company, so we're trying to get to where Coke is, although it's like much older than us. Definitely the ambition, we do understand that to some degree, to a lot of consumers, it looks exactly the same. And what really makes a difference is brand. And that is definitely the next part of what we're doing. So when we started, it was really just about the service, you know, because I still remember, like, I used to, when I joined three years ago, we used to take bets whether the car would come. I would sit next to my friends, they'll book a car and say, all right, let's see whether this thing works, right? Those days are, you know, today it is a reliable option to driving. It is something that people can use every day. Um, and, and so when that happened, then we decided to rebrand. And our big focus of the rebrand, a lot, you know, we were thinking, should we, should we give it meaning? Should we make it emotional? Should we do all these things? But um, we decided to focus on the service and also to make, let people know what the new Grab Taxi looks like, and it looks like Grab. And that's been our focus. We, we spent a lot of effort just on the visual identity, so that if you see the brand, you see the color, you see a bit, a small bit of it, you know that that's Grab. The next phase of that is really the, the brand part. And the reason why we've taken so long to kind of get started is because I don't believe in in like branding per se. I, I think it needs to be from the inside out. And so we need to distill it really well and then make sure everybody in the organization understands it. You know, I think in the past, what I, I heard this from someone, that I can't remember who, but in the past, marketing, you know, it's like, a, it's like a black box. You know, companies are like a black box. And when it comes to branding, you just project whatever you want onto that, that black box. People can't see what's inside. Today, it's a glass box. So you can tell whatever you want to the people out there about what your brand is, but it really does need to start from the inside. And, and that's really why we haven't really um, rolled out in a big way. I think there's a lot of work to be done. We do believe in brand. I mean, I, I know how consumers are impacted by it, and I'm, and I'm impacted by it as well. Uh, but it's something that we're just sort of like getting started with. If we can quickly touch on collaboration as well. You talked about your collaboration with Pokemon um, and also Tinder. I believe. Yep. Um, so uh, how strategic is that? And, and how much does that help your brand? Um, so I think we really do believe in partnerships. And there's a lot of them that we, we really like, because especially if you have sort of like the same ideology, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and I think it, it's a great way in which both sides can kind of benefit from a from something, uh, from the synergies on both sides, right? So if I talked about Tinder, I think that was a great partnership in the sense that, you know, they were a very big brand, quite controversial as well. Um, 
And I think that helped. We, we, and then we are known to be a bit more safer brand. And, and then we work together to use GrabShare, which is the carpooling service, to show you know, like it's not that weird to be in a car with another person, which was the whole premise of the, the campaign. But of course, we use, uh, we use influencers because we didn't want it to be mistaken as like a hookup kind of thing. It was just to show that connections can be made online and they can be, they can be enriching. Right. Well, before I ask you to thank Cheryl, uh, let me remind you of the next sessions today. After the break, this room will split into two stages, as I said earlier, innovation stage and population stage. The content and people stages can be found the other side of the exhibition hall. Again, if you need assistance, do ask. At 11, the innovation stage is kicking off with a panel discussion on growth hacking for marketing success. On the population stage, that will feature international speaker Lou Hoffman, who will be discussing whether the public relations industry really gets storytelling. At the content stage, you will find another panel discussion on when failure is the industry norm. How do you content, do content marketing well? And the people stage, meanwhile, will kick off today with an interesting session on Meet the Centennials why kids are going to destroy the internet as we know it with Dylan Collins. Finally, the Masterclass Theatre will uh, teach you about uh, combining emotion with data in uh, B2B marketing, which is the only session kicking off uh, earlier at 10.30 a.m. Tough decisions, which ones to go for later though. Now, please do join me in thanking Cheryl for that wonderful presentation. <laughs> See you later, guys. <laughs>